800 years ago, a magnificent, great kingdom of progress disappeared off the face of the earth, and with it, a hundred years of the world's foundational history. It's a miracle such a place ever existed, a model for the future to strive towards, and yet, we aren't allowed to know anything about it. In its place, the world government was born, and any and all knowledge of this original dynasty is forbidden. But why? What is it we aren't supposed to know? What is the New World Order so afraid of? As a One Piece fan smack in the middle of the manga's home stretch, you and me both have likely seen many theories come to the forefront, attempting to answer the story's greatest and most pressing questions. What happened in the Void Century? What is the name of the Ancient Kingdom? Who are the Clan of D? And most importantly, the Holy Grail of Mysteries, what is the One Piece? Today, I will be attempting to answer these questions, maybe not accurately, but at the very least, logically. My name is Hidden, and to you, ladies and gentlemen, I say welcome once again to the Hidden Island, where we'll be discussing the truth about everything. I'd like to preface this by talking about the videos that this will probably be compared with. I've seen a bunch of very popular theories trying to answer these same questions, but no matter how entertaining those theories are to think about, they never sat right with me as satisfying answers. The removal and re-addition of the letter D from important names and locations, the island of Laughtail being the missing left eye or the one missing piece of Jaya, an interesting idea at first glance, but it fails to explain why the world government has put its subjects through 800 years of misery. It doesn't give me a satisfying answer as to why they have gone to such brutal lengths to cover up the One Piece or the Will of D's existence. Sure, it fits as a potentially missing puzzle piece, but it doesn't carry with it the context that a reveal of that magnitude should. I feel the same way about another popular theory, suggesting that the One Piece is a bottle of sake. Yes, a bottle of sake would line up with the themes of the story. Yes, a bottle of sake may be such a plain and anticlimactic treasure that it would probably make someone laugh, but it doesn't feel like the answers the free world is seeking at Laugh Tale would be provided by such an object. I can't logically find a way for the bottle of sake itself to be the catalyst of worldwide change, especially when a majority of the people in the world of One Piece who the government wished to keep in the dark would have no clue what that bottle even represented. Whatever the One Piece is, whatever the Will of D represents, and whatever the world government is hiding, must be something that the people of the world would rally behind. Something a lot bigger, a lot more obvious, and more in your face. So much so that even your local mayor or milkmaid could not ignore it. And so, while this theory will make a lot of overlapping points with or use a lot of the same evidence as these other mega theories, the conclusions that will be reached today are completely different. This is a theory that is heavily predicated on context. The story of the Void Century has been told to us in befores and afters, but the events there within are completely unknown, so in order to figure out what happened, our best bet is to look at what happened elsewhere in the story, in a comparable context. In other words, the only way for us to fill in the blanks is to look at how the story has been written so far. And in order to answer questions about the Void Century, we need to first answer a very important question about the circumstances that caused it to happen in the first place. What was the world government before they were the world government? The answer to this is what they don't want people to know. It's why they don't want people to find the One Piece, because in doing so they would learn the history that would expose something about the government's identity that would threaten their authority over the world. So what is it? The short answer is, the world government was started and founded by pirates. It was a pirate alliance. 
all of the world nobles are actually descendants of the original 20 pirate captains that banded together against the ancient kingdom. And if this were true, then that would mean that the celestial dragons are not gods at all. They are not divine and hold no claim to superiority over everyone else. News like that would surely inspire mass outcry and more importantly, worldwide revolution which would also mean that the reason they hunt pirates so intensely is because they deeply fear someone else forming an alliance of their own and repeating the history of 800 years ago. Does this all sound familiar? Roxdi Zebek is a pirate who was erased from all records and said to have been one of the strongest in history. 40 years ago, one fateful meeting between a collection of powerful pirates on Fololed Island was followed by an alliance turned crew, captained by Rox himself, but their ambition went beyond just King of the Pirates. Rox de Zebek wanted to be king of the world. It was because he broke such a major taboo that his existence was covered up. If a man only truly dies when he is forgotten, then the world government did everything in their power to make sure that this man and his legacy stayed dead. They erased him from not only the present, but from the past as well. Unfortunately for them, fools who don't respect the past are doomed to repeat it. Another example we see in the story is the new Onigashima project created by Big Mom and Kaido where they form a pirate alliance with the intention of, you guessed it, taking over the world. More specifically, they chose Wano as the base of their new pirate empire because it's a natural fortress high above the sea and nearly impenetrable. Their intention was to move the island of Onigashima, drop it on the flower capital, rename the country and enslave its populace, and from there they would start and lead a world war and an era of violence. Doesn't that sound a lot like what the world nobles did? The original 20 kings took part in some war or conflict that wiped out the great kingdom prior to forming a new government and taking over the world. They then relocated their original kingdoms to the top of the red line, a natural fortress, the land of gods, where the kingdom of Lunarians formerly stood now stands a kingdom of violence and slave labor. Or how about Enel, who wanted to destroy Skypia and take his chosen few with him to live in what he considered the land of the gods up on the moon. He believed he was special, when in reality he was just a usurper destroying a kingdom and attempting to create his own in its place. Once again, history threatening to repeat itself. Who runs the world government now? Eam, the person who sits on the empty throne. And the person who sits on the empty throne is the king of the world. And becoming king of the world seems to be the ultimate treasure for the most corrupted of pirates. And if history has repeated itself here, then what does that say about the current king of the world? That Eam was once a pirate with ambitions just like Rox? That where Rox and Kaido and Big Mom once failed, Eam had succeeded? Maybe. You might be thinking, Hidden. The creators were explicitly stated to have been the kings of various countries, including Alabasta and Dress Rosa. How could they have been pirates? Well, why trust the history we've been told when we've only heard it from the guys who made a career off erasing the truth? And besides, I never said that pirates and kings are mutually exclusive. The theme of pirate kingdoms and empires comes up time and time again in the story. Let's find a point of comparison. The world government is a corrupt kingdom with corrupted leadership. They are an authoritarian regime. Can we think of any other places or kingdoms like this in the story? Off the top of my head, Dressrosa, Totaland, and Wano are great examples, and what do these places have in common? They are ruled by pirates. Each of these countries belonged to another monarch before they were invaded and overthrown by a pirate crew, who would then go on to replace them as the new governing body. So, what if I told you that Oda has shown us the events of the Void Century already multiple times, that throughout One Piece he has been telling us the story of Joy Boy and Emu over and over again? There is a recurring theme and pattern in the arcs of One Piece that has stayed consistent from the beginning of the story up until now. Almost every major arc taking place on the islands most relevant to the Void Century follow this pattern. There is a prosperous kingdom with a righteous king. The people of this kingdom are subverted or outright invaded by a group of villains, usually pirates. There is a hero character who fights against the new order and ultimately fails. The hero's legacy and the legacy of the rightful king are tarnished or outright erased. The country is then ruled by these invaders until Luffy finally arrives and succeeds the legacy of the fallen hero character, freeing the country from a tyrannical regime. 
In basically every arc, there was always peace, followed by invasion, followed by resistance, followed by failure. There is almost always a pirate captain turned king, and always a hero who tries to change things only to ultimately fail. In other words, there is almost always a parallel to Emu and a parallel to Joy Boy. You'll see this all over the series. Arlong and Bellamere, Wapol and Hiraluk, Crocodile and Vivi, Hody and Fisher Tiger, Doflamingo and Kiros, Kaido and Odin. Every villain I just named, these men who all parallel Emu are, or at one point were, pirates. Pirates are just as capable of becoming the kings of nations as any other actual king. In fact, the two most relevant, fully named descendants of the original 20 kings so far, Nefertari Vivi and Don Quixote do Flamingo, both spent time as royalty and as pirates. In Dofi's case, he was not only king, but a pirate warlord at the same time. The biggest faction of pirates in the power balance of the world are the four emperors, pirates who became so powerful that they are the literal emperors of various countries and territories. Big Mom is the queen of Whole Cake Island. Kaido controlled Wano through Shogun Orochi. The Rock's crew was made up of the future emperors of the sea, so is it so crazy to suggest that the original 20 kings were likewise powerful pirates in command of their own territories and kingdoms? The example has been laid out for us many times before. In Dressrosa, the Tantata tribe tell us about one of these kings, the original King Don Quixote from over 900 years ago. One of the very few pre-Void Century looks we get in the series, and it is made very clear to us that this original king was a very evil man, enslaving the Tantata for many years. In the modern age, aside from the world government themselves, who else is responsible for slavery? Kaido built his empire off slave labor. Big Mom uses the souls of others to create loyal servants. Doflamingo was the head of a slave trading racket. Slavery is a tool of the evil, and the evil, in some way or another, tend to be involved with piracy. And what exactly are pirates? Organized groups of criminals who take to the seas, disregarding the law, who rob and attack and steal from others. They oftentimes take their own territory, and within those territories, they collect tribute from the people who live there. If we think about things such as Buster calling an island with a fleet of ships, or collecting the heavenly tribute, or giving certain groups of pirates free reign to loot and pillage as much as they like, the world government doesn't seem that much different from the likes of Arlong and Big Mom. Oda has already demonstrated to us that there's an extremely thin line between the world of pirates and the world of marines. Well, what if there wasn't a line at all? The only thing differentiating the two is who writes the history book. If we look at the world government through a pirate's lens, then certain things about their structure start to make a lot more sense. The three admirals mirroring the typical three Yonko commanders. The vice admirals and their fleet of ships are not so different from the grand fleets of pirates. The heavenly tribute is just a fancy version of a pirate's tribute money. Maybe it's a stretch, but even the flag of the world government is suspicious. It's said to represent the unity of the kings from each of the four seas and the Grand Line, but it could just as easily represent the alliance of pirates pirates from each of the four seas. If you turn the flag just 45 degrees, it almost becomes a simplified version of the skull and crossbones seen on a typical pirate flag. The power balance of the world is made up of the emperors, the warlords, and the marines, meaning in ordinary context, the marines are the only ones in this balance that aren't pirates. But if they technically were, as I'm suggesting, then all three factions in the balance of power would be pirates fighting over who gets to be boss. If that's the case, then the title of Pirate King would be a lot more important to the balance of power than it may at first seem. So, we have a possible answer for what the world government is. Great, that's one half of the story, but what about the other half? If the 20 kings, the creators, were actually just frauds, pirates overthrowing the world's greatest kingdom, then who the hell were they replacing? Let's plug in our pieces. Back in the O'Hara flashback, Professor Clover speaks of what he and his colleagues learned while studying the Poneglyphs. He states that the greatest truth we seek in the world today is not the Poneglyph, but the reason for its existence. The people of the past wrote their history on stone because they feared their message would be eradicated, proving that those people had an enemy. The birth of the world government coincides with the annihilation of those ancient people, thus giving us our enemy, and this means that the Void Century must contain an inconvenient truth for the world government. 
in my opinion, the pirate stuff that we discussed before. But after this, Clover mentioned something incredibly important. He and the other scholars, through the Poneglyphs, discovered the existence of a nation of which no trace remains. Within the Poneglyphs is a history proving the existence of an immense kingdom, a massive, thriving nation with incredible power, responsible for the creation or at least the possession of the ancient weapons. But here's the kicker. Clover asserts that while the government claims the threat of the ancient weapons are their reason for covering up the past, that is merely a facade, a lie. The truth is that the very existence and idea of this kingdom is what the government finds to be so threatening. And just as he's about to say the name of this kingdom, he is hastily shot and interrupted. Why? Why stop him from saying the kingdom's name? It's because the name of this kingdom must be greatly significant. So significant that just the name alone is enough to reveal some of the truth. If it was a name that was erased with the Void Century, then what's the danger? If it was a name that no one would recognize, then why cover it up? Let's say the ancient kingdom was called Bingo Bongo. No one in or out of the One Piece world would have any clue what that means or what makes it significant. They would have no need to hide it. Therefore, the name of this kingdom, definitely not Bingo Bongo, must still be relevant, even 800 years later. This tells us that whatever Professor Clover was about to say would have been instantly recognizable by a majority of people in the world of One Piece. It is a name that any person, anywhere, noble or commoner, would hear and then immediately make the connection. They would instantly learn something about the truth of the world, and there's only one name I can think of in the entire story that would fit this criteria. The Kingdom of One Piece. The name of the kingdom that Clover was about to speak are the very words on the front of every volume, every piece of merchandise, and every statement to become Pirate King. We've been conditioned to think for so long that One Piece is an object, something you can hold in your hands. We always say the One Piece, that the in the front making it sound as if it's an object, but in Japanese they don't have an equivalent for the word the. They don't have a distinction, it's just One Piece. Oda himself said that One Piece is not something like the journey itself was the real treasure, but it has never been stated to be an object or thing. It has only been stated to be a physical reward. And I guess when we think of physical rewards, we imagine something we can carry with us. But if that were the case, then why would Roger leave it behind? His crew wasn't deathly ill, only he was. Wouldn't it be better to leave something of such great importance with someone he trusts, rather than leave it there exposed to the elements? Or is it maybe because One Piece is something physical, but also something which cannot be moved? In other words, One Piece is not a thing, but a place. What we've been searching for the whole time. The greatest treasure in the world is a lost civilization, a forgotten kingdom. Not just any kingdom, but the true kingdom of the world and of the true gods. I think that Oda has been foreshadowing this quite a lot, starting all the way back in Jaya during a conversation about dreams. Luffy is trying to go to Sky Island and Bellamy is trying to chastise and belittle Luffy for believing in myths and legends. And while doing so, he names a bunch of popular legends, including El Dorado, the Emerald City, and Curious one Piece. Notice anything strange? The first two, El Dorado and the Emerald City, are locations. If we continue their pattern, then the third thing Bellamy mentioned would make sense to be a location as well. If not, then it would be like me saying, Haha, Luffy, you believe in such crazy things. Narnia, Hogwarts, and the Easter Bunny. How dumb. See how the third option being a different type of noun just comes off wrong? How it would make more sense for One Piece to be a mythical location just like the other two? There's a bunch of other foreshadowing done in the form of symbolism involving the right eye, but we'll talk more about this later. Anyway, if you want to take it further, I believe that One Piece is only a homophone, and the actual name of the kingdom while sounding the same is spelled like this, the Kingdom of One Piece. I think the word peace is Oda's typical wordplay at work, much like how Raftel was was actually Laugh Tale. The name of the kingdom has only been spread from ear to ear because the government sure as hell won't write about it, so it's easy to see the name being written as peace because of hundreds of years of people playing telephone. And like I said earlier, the association with treasure and a physical, holdable reward might incline people to think of this version of peace instead. One Piece is also referred to as the Great Hitotsunagi Treasure in Japanese. However, the meaning of Hitotsunagi has not yet been clarified. The most upfront meaning translates to, in one 
one piece. If you've seen Ohara's video, you'd know that another interpretation of this is the rope linking all men. However, there's a third possible reading of Hitotsunagi that can translate to one sea at peace, with the kanji for nagi here meaning tranquility or peace with an A. In the prototype manga for One Piece, Romance Dawn, Oda gives us a rough outline of what the world of One Piece would later be like. In this manga, there are two types of pirates in the world, Morganeers, the rough and tumble greedy pirates that tend to be the bad guys, and Peace Mains, good pirates who only seek freedom and adventure. Notice how before the title of One Piece ever became a thing, Oda had peace on the mind, but not peace with an I, it's the other spelling. And also notice the lack of a marine aspect in this prototype, it's just good good pirates and bad pirates. In the situation where this is all true and the world government were originally pirates, then maybe Romance Dawn shows us what Oda was thinking back in 1997. The world government are just an abstract version of the Morganeers idea. A group of Morganeers turned kings 800 years ago, and the Straw Hats are the peace main pirates trying to find one peace and take back the world. And think about this, the world has come to associate the hunt for the One Piece with the ambitions of pirates. If it were revealed to the world that the kingdom attacked by the world government was One Piece, and that the celestial dragons themselves sought out the same treasure as pirates, then what does that tell us about the world government? Their pirate history would be revealed. All perfectly good reasons for the name of this kingdom alone to be a major threat to their power. Things coming together? There's another running theme in the story, wherein after the leaders of a country are replaced, the deposed royalty take to the sea as pirates. We see Vivi go from princess to pirate, Momo as well. Even Wapol became a pirate after he was kicked out of his own kingdom. When you lose a war, the victors decide who's good and who's evil. And as always with the world government, anyone who stands in opposition to them are labeled monsters, criminals, and pirates most of all. Perhaps the kingdom was mislabeled as evil, a kingdom without law and order, a kingdom of pirates, and the survivors of this ancient kingdom were labeled as pirates to be hunted down, and the search for this kingdom was outlawed as an act of piracy. So I ask you, what is the reward for the man who finds One Piece? If you stumbled upon a completely empty kingdom with no civilization and no one there to object, you can effectively claim it for yourself. Think of an astronaut sticking their country's flag somewhere on the moon because they were the first ones there. You don't even need an astronaut for an example, we have one in the story, just think of an L. In other words, the one who finds it inherits this so-called lost kingdom of pirates and by extension, its future. A kingdom for a king. A pirate king. Maybe an ironic name to take away from how important of a king that actually is. In certain instances, the pirate king has been made synonymous with the king of the sea, and uh, <laughs> there's a lot of sea in the world. If the person who finds and claims the kingdom of One Piece becomes the king of the pirates, and if the king of the pirates is also the ruler of the sea, then who was the original king? Who was the true king of the One Piece world? Before we continue with the theory, if you like what you've seen so far, please don't forget to like and subscribe to keep the music alive. And if you're looking to give some extra support to the channel with some extra content in return, consider subscribing to my Patreon. Link in the description. This is probably a great time to uh, talk about my existing patrons. I just wanted to give a shout out and a thank you to them because they did actually play a part in the making of this video. I do talk to my patrons a lot and uh, a lot of the ideas that you're hearing now in this video, I did bounce off of them originally. They've been super supportive and super helpful from the beginning. So I just want to give a big thank you to Zagrash, Adria, Dill, Lazos, uh, reverse. All of you guys are awesome, super, super cool, and uh, I just wanted to show my appreciation there. Anyway, before we can talk about the Pirate King, we need to talk about eyes. Eyes seem to be rather important in One Piece, whether we're talking about Scars, Conqueror's Hockey, or whatever the hell is up with Mihawk. While Ohara's mega theory focused on the left eye symbolism present in One Piece, I think we should be looking at the other side of the proverbial face here. After this segment, I want to see how many of you guys prefer the right eye theory to the left eye theory. Who knows, maybe it's both, but there are countless examples in the story of the right eye being used to symbolize something, and that can also be traced back to Skypiea, where the city of Shandora, which literally translates to the skull's right eye, is situated in the right eye of Jaya. Shandora is a parallel to the One Piece. Shandora is Jaya's treasure, a fabled city of gold. 
El Dorado, the treasure that Nolan found and was ultimately executed for, just like Roger. The point I'm trying to make is that Chandora is to Jaya what One Piece is to Laugh Tale, and suddenly, seemingly innocuous things like this dog with a one on its head and an X over its right eye become a lot more suspicious. This dog is One Poco, and he's from Dress Rosa. Interestingly, there's other overt references to an open or marked right eye throughout the Dress Rosa arc. Jola created this artwork with her devil fruit displaying an open right eye, and there's more to this image that we'll talk about later. Viola's devil fruit allows her to use her eyes to see the truth, and our first introduction to her devil fruit is her peering into Sanji's mind with her right eye. Later, she uses the same power to locate the Thousand Sunny and, look at this, a familiar image. When we first see the truth about Doflamingo's past, he awakes from his rest in a panic. And here we get our first and only look at one of his eyes, the right eye, coming up yet again. Even later, the first time we see Emu, we only see his or her right eye. So what is my point? Wasn't this supposed to be a section about the Pirate King? Bear with me just a second. It'll all make sense. The right eye. Why does it keep coming up again and again? What could it mean? Well, if we go back to our friend, One Poco, X marks the spot. We see an X over the right eye below the mysterious word one, possibly in reference to One Piece. Viola's right eye allows her to see the truth, and the right eye of the skull is the location of Jaya's treasure, the place where the truth about the island is revealed. So, there is a connection being made between three things, the One Piece, the truth, and right eyes. Well, if we do a quick search for the symbology of right eyes in the real world, one of the most popular and immediate results will show you it's symbolically associated with the right eye of the Egyptian god Ra. One of the most important Egyptian gods, and more importantly, it's his right eye that is said to represent the sun. As a matter of fact, Ra himself is the sun god of Egypt, so what if this is the message that Oda is sending us? The truth lies in the right eye. The kingdom is there in the eye of the sun. The truth, in other words, One Piece, is the kingdom of the Sun God, and there's only one Sun God in the One Piece story, Nika. This theory is going to assume Nika and Joy Boy are one and the same, as the announcement of Joy Boy's return coincided with the awakening of the Nika fruit, and I don't have any good reason to assume they're separate people at the time of making this video. So let's finally try and answer the question, who was the original king of the seas? Joy Boy, naturally. Fitting then that the ones to carry on his will are Goldie Roger, King of the Pirates, and Luffy, the future King of the Pirates. I think Joy Boy, also known as the Sun God Nika, was once the King of the Great Kingdom, the Kingdom of One Piece. I think that Nika was a benevolent king and that the tales of him being a great liberator are true. I believe that the ancient kingdom was the strongest kingdom in the world, as large and expansive as the world government. However, it was the opposite in nature. Rather than annexing and enslaving nations, I theorized that Joy Boy was would go from island to island, defeating evil kings and pirates, and freeing slaves from their captors. And the newly freed people would then go on to live in peace, becoming another part of the great kingdom of One Piece. After all, the king of One Piece, the pirate king, is the freest man in the world, and his nation was one likewise centered around freedom, an idea that would likely upset a certain group of 20 slave-owning kings who would ally together and begin a war for supremacy that would last a century. And while we're talking about Joy Boy, what's the deal with this hat? First, let me explain with certainty why this hat belongs to Joy Boy. Luffy has some heavy associations with the sun, and so does Goldie Roger, who is the original owner of Luffy's signature straw hat. Luffy's ship, the Thousand Sunny, and its Sun Lion figurehead speak for themselves, and ignoring the fact that he is the literal second coming of Joy Boy, another interesting point is the straw hat itself, which when viewed from the side looks almost like a sun rising up over the horizon. The hat looks like the dawn itself, reinforced by how Luffy comes from and gets his hat on Dawn Island. If we go back to our friend One Poco yet again, we'll see our other friend, Thunder Soldier, another toy with another message on his head, and this one looks like a sunrise, but the word soul is written across it in red letters, giving it the appearance of Luffy's straw hat. Soul, by the way, is not only the Spanish word for sun, but also the name of the Roman god of the sun. This is not just any straw hat. This hat belongs to the king of One Piece. This is the crown of the sun god. 
If you haven't seen it yet, I made a video about how Laugh Tale and the Ancient Kingdom may have been inspired by the Roman Empire, one of the largest empires in ancient history that is equally famous for its eventual downfall. Such a thing would explain the naming conventions of the ancient weapons, and one thing I didn't mention in that video was that it also explains the giant straw hat being a crown. In Rome, the highest and rarest honor one could receive was the grass crown, a crown typically given to generals or commanders whose actions saved an army or a large number of people. Remember this part. The crown would be given to them by the army they had saved. The most important detail, however, is what the crown was made of. They would make the crown not from gold or silver, but out of plants taken from the earth more specifically grass, flowers, and wheat, the very same ingredients used to make straw, the straw crown of the pirate king. Think back to when Luffy first got his hat. Luffy stated that he will be pirate king and in response, Shanks placed this upon his head. This is the same man who Luffy got the Nika fruit from. Twelve years later and Joy Boy has returned, crown and all. Go figure. Thus, the goals of Luffy and Blackbeard, Roger and Zebek, are diametrically opposed. Luffy wants to become Pirate King, succeeding the legacy of Joy Boy and his kingdom, while Blackbeard presumably wants to be King of the World, succeeding and replacing Emu and his kingdom. One wants to break free from the cycle, and the other wants to start the cycle anew, the only thing connecting the two of them being a single, mysterious letter. Now, I'm sure you're ready to talk about the Willa D, because I sure am. I'll save you some explanation and cut right to what I think. That theory that's been floating around for a while, that the D is actually a half moon or Hangetsu in Japanese, I believe it, but for different reasons than the ones we've been given before. Let's start with the safe assumption. Nika slash Joy Boy is the originator of the Will of D. The Will of D is Nika's will, one that has been passed down for generations through the D clan. If we're going to figure out what the D means, then maybe we should start with what it could mean in the context of its originator, Nika. Well, what do we know about Nika so far? He was considered a god sometime in the past, possibly like how the people of Skypiea call their king god. Or maybe like how people referred to Lunarians, the fiery godlike beings who once lived on top of the Red Line. Whether it's the Skypians or the Lunarians, the connection between the winged races and the sun god is there. And I think Nika was a Lunarian. Based on his devil fruit, we can conclude that he had fire on his head, was incredibly resilient, and also primarily white, a color associated not only with the hair of Lunarians, but with the Sulong transformations of the Minx, all tied to the moon. You might say, hidden, he doesn't have any wings. Well, NL didn't have any wings, Gonfall didn't have any wings, and neither did this guy. Coincidentally, all three of these people once served as god of Skypiea. So if Nika was a Lunarian and Nika and the Lunarians are gone, how did his will pass forward? Through his children. We already know that the will of D is a hereditary thing. It passes from parent to child. Well, if that's the case, then there has to have been a first parent. Who else besides Nika? But that's strange, isn't it? Most of the D clan seem to have a different hair color than Lunarians, typically black or red. They don't all have tanned skin, wings, and can't naturally conjure fire. So how could they be Nika's descendants? They look nothing like him. Well, what if Nika had children with a human woman? What if his offspring, the first members of the D clan, were half Lunarian, half human? In other words, half moon people. Thus, a half moon in the shape of a D. But who was Nika's bride? Perhaps the woman was a Kozuki, a woman who'd come to be known as the Moon Princess, and that's why the symbol of the moon is so important to the Kozuki as well. Maybe that's why Odin also smiled in his final moments just like a D member. Maybe Wano and the Lunarian Kingdom were married nations in a way. That's why they've been waiting so long and so adamantly for Joy Boy's return. Despite Wano being an isolated country, it would make sense for the D-Clan to come from there and be scattered around the world at least 800 years ago. Toki is a character we meet who actually came from the Void Century, and despite being part of the Amatsuki family, she hadn't ever been to Wano herself. Does that mean that during Joy Boy's rule, Wano was an open country, or were the people of Wano somewhere else? Worth considering. Once again, half human, half Lunarian. Over the generations, their lineage factor would dilute enough to not possess any of Nika's visual characteristics, so in order to let his name carry forward into the future, a sign of the rebellion much like the Kozuki moon tattoo, Nika's lineage would carry the D, the half moon, the symbol of their clan. 
the Half Moon Clan, the original and rightful heirs to the Kingdom of One Piece. The D Clan is the true royalty, not the celestial dragons, and that's why they are the enemies of the gods, because the gods of this modern world are not the real gods. Maybe this all sounds silly, but let me ask you. Why is it that the D-Clan are always able to smile in the face of death? Luffy couldn't seem to control his own laughter in his Nika form, a hereditary feature maybe. Why did two of these guys get fire-related abilities, two brothers no less? Maybe Oda is trying to tell us something. What's with this weird tattoo that Dragon decided to get? Why is it that we've seen nearly every D-Clan member somehow rise to the top? Why do they all draw people under their command? Is it just charisma? Looking at this list, almost everyone here is or has at one point captained a crew of people. They're at the top of each of their respective chains of command. Garp and Saul are both vice admirals, the highest position one can reach in the marines without having to answer to the gods. Dragon is the leader of a revolutionary movement outright at war with the gods. Rox was the strongest pirate in the world, followed by Roger and soon to be followed by Luffy. Ace was hard tracked for the same thing and even in his death he catalyzed the end of an era. Law is a captain of his own with a 3 billion berry bounty and Blackbeard is an emperor of the sea. Rouge, well, she didn't captain anything, but she did curiously hold a baby inside her for 20 months, something most people write off as contrived, but what if it wasn't just plot armor? What if the D-Clan are actually just extra resilient by nature? Nika and Luffy by extension seem to be incredibly durable. We've seen other D-Clan members take incredible beatings, stuff that would kill most people. Maybe Rouge was only able to keep Ace in for 20 months because she was a D, because she had that Lunarian in her. What about Saul? He's a giant, right? Well, look, I'm not a geneticist or a biologist or anything, but that hat in Mary Jo looks pretty damn big, so if there's any other race in the One Piece world that I could see possessing a D name, it would be the Giants. Also, back in the chapter 70 SBS, Oda is asked what the D stands for, and he said he can't answer, but to just read it as a D for now. Curious wording, right? The just read it as a D for now kind of implies that the D itself can be read in a different way. If so, then the idea of the D being a symbol rather than a letter makes more sense. A symbol to be read as the half moon was passed down over the generations to mark Nika's lineage, a family secret that was kept for years and years, a name you weren't supposed to tell people until finally many figures with the letter D in their name began to rise up all at the same time and the world couldn't help but notice. Maybe that's why the Gorosei are suddenly panicking about putting Nika's likeness on a wanted poster with the letter D in there. Maybe some of the D-Clan, like Marshall D. Teach or Rox D. Zebek, knew the truth of their heritage, and because of this, they felt that they were the rightful kings of the world. Is that why they chose Full Lead Island as their base, yet another island with that right eye of the skull symbolism? What about the cover of One Piece Volume 27, where Luffy is depicted with wings and his right eye open? Obviously in reference to the Skypiea arc, but this could also be a hint regarding Luffy's connection to Nika. After some recent revelations, I honestly wouldn't put it past Oda to do such a thing. Maybe other examples, just like this one, are hiding around the story in plain sight. So, now we have our man Joy Boy, also known as Nika, the sun god and the former ruler of the Lost Kingdom of One Piece, the legendary treasure that the world is looking for. The Straw Hat was his crown, and the Clan of D are his ancestors, and they were all wiped out by a collective of pirates who now call themselves the World Government. But where is Laugh Tale? The world government would have had it erased by now if they could. And even if they could read the poneglyphs, each of the necessary road poneglyphs are either very well hidden, constantly moving, or in the possession of a pirate. What I'm saying is that even if they once tried to destroy or capture One Piece, they obviously weren't successful. If so, then that means Laugh Tale and the One Piece must have been hidden from them. And what would make that possible? How do you hide an entire island or series of islands, or an entire continent for that matter, beneath the sea. The ancient tale of Atlantis is a story in Greek mythology where the people of this mythical city defied the gods and their island was sunk into the ocean, never to be seen again. The lost city of Atlantis was possibly a major influence on the lost island of Laugh Tale, and also a big influence on the concept of Fishman Island. And what do we have on Fishman Island? An ancient weapon, known as Poseidon, with the power to command the Sea Kings, a power so great, apparently, that it can sink islands beneath the waves. 
If Laugh Tale were in the water, then it would make a lot more sense as to why people can't find it, because the Grand Line is a very turbulent, unpredictable place. You could sail right over it countless times without noticing, and you could lose your way very easily, because it can't be seen above the surface with the naked eye. To reach it, you'd need to not only coat your ship, but also know the exact spot to dive down. And on an ocean as vast and unpredictable as that, it would be next to impossible unless you had coordinates. If you had, let's say, four specific coordinates that would cross and create an X, the exact point where you would have to sail and dive down in order to reach Laugh Tail, then things would be a lot more manageable. And if Laugh Tail really is down there, it would also bring Devil Fruits into a new light, potentially. If, by chance, Devil Fruits came from the ancient kingdom of One Piece, and if this ancient kingdom is buried beneath the sea, then maybe the reason Devil Fruit users sink in water is because their fruit's power is trying to return home. Many potential ways to go with this one. We do know that Joy Boy had a close relationship with Poseidon, the mermaid princess of 800 years ago, and we know that the current Poseidon tends to activate her powers when she cries. Did the original Poseidon shed tears for Joy Boy after he died? Did those tears sink his kingdom into the sea? An event that would earn her power the title of ancient weapon? Maybe it was done in order to protect their history from being destroyed, not unlike how, during the Buster Call, the scholars of Ohara threw their books out of the tree and into the lake to prevent them from burning. Is it possible that she sank many islands with this power for a similar purpose? Why are all the most important locations in relation to the ancient kingdom elevated so high above sea level? Zo is on the back of a giant elephant, Lunarians lived on top of the red line, and Wano is on top of a mountain. Elbath seems like it's going to feature a massively tall tree, and even Water 7, the birthplace of Pluton, is an island constantly building upward to avoid sinking into the ocean. Was there a mass sinking of islands, or a great flooding? Were all these nations trying to avoid following Laugh Tale beneath the waves, in order to preserve some history, or in order to keep moving forward? It definitely makes sense as to why the Celestial Dragons moved from their respective kingdoms to the top of the Red Line, kind of like how Wapole left his country the moment Blackbeard arrived and abandoned his people. Maybe the Celestial Dragons, once the world started to flood, left the ocean, abandoned their people, and went to the top of the Red Line. Looking back on how Vivi complained when Wapol did just this action, maybe the original Nefertari king saw the tragedy in all this destruction and chose to stay behind as well. Maybe he chose not to abandon his people. With One Piece gone, its king presumably dead, and much of the world sinking beneath the sea, the 19 kings took flight to the top of Marijoa where it was safe, and the mysteries hidden at Laugh Tale would remain there for 800 years. Let's look again at this beautiful work of art we got back in Dress Rosa. <laughs> I told you guys we would come back to this. Look at what we have here and try to apply this to the context of our theory today. A sun, a sad king underneath, towards the side with the open eye, the right eye. He has a single wing coming out from behind him, and above him, Chopper sports some interesting wings and he's accompanied by rabbits, commonly thought to be from the moon in Japanese folklore. Lunarians perhaps? Maybe. The big chopper creature on the Lunarian side with the half-colored spiral pattern is trying to block out or hide the sun. Maybe this symbolizes hiding the kingdom of the sun, while the blocky, rigid Nami creature on the other side is being held back from the sun by the tears of the left eye, maybe representing the tears of Poseidon sinking the kingdom of the sun beneath the waves and hiding it from those who would harm it. Maybe in just this panel alone, Oda told us everything. The ancient pirate alliance the Sun God, the Sun Crown, the Half Moon Clan, and the Great Kingdom of One Piece. Or maybe I'm just overthinking things. After all, there's no way Oda planned it all out this far, right? Well, that was a lot to go over. If you're still here, thanks for sticking around. There's so much more to talk about, but unfortunately this is the entire story of One Piece we're trying to unravel, so we can only talk about so much in just one video, but I hope that over the course of this channel's life we'll get to talk about everything else, one piece at a time. If you found today's theory interesting, don't forget to like and subscribe to see more like this in the future. And if you believe Nika is a Lunarian and want to hear my theory on where Devil Fruits came from, check out my Ultimate Devil Fruit Theory. It might help to hold you over until my next upload, because this will be my last major upload before my five-week trip to Japan, so I hope it was worth the wait. Starting next week, I'll be over in Wano myself, and working on some fresh, new One Piece vlog content straight from the source, so look forward to that. And finally, thank you once again for stopping by the Hidden Island. I hope you've enjoyed today's show, because we sure enjoyed putting it on, and until next time, have a beautiful day, a pleasant night, and a wonderful romance dawn.